Welcome to Concordia. Whether it's your first time or you are someone who calls Concordia home, we are glad to have you join us for service today. This is a place where people matter, hope is real, and the love of Jesus is at the heart of all we do. Our service will last about an hour and will include worship through music, prayer, and an uplifting message for your week ahead. If you're here for the first time, we'd like to invite you to visit one of the counters in the lobby after worship so we can meet you and give you a special gift to thank you for checking out Concordia. Children are always welcome in our services, but if you need to step out with them, visit our family room in the lobby where you can continue to watch the service live. Our free app provides a worship guide and sermon notes if you want to follow along. You can find the app by searching Concordia San Antonio in your favorite app store. Please take just a moment to go to our website or our app and hit the word connect. That will take you to our connect card. You can share prayer requests, learn more about serving, and find ways to get involved here at Concordia. You can also text CROSS to 51555 to get the Connect card right to your phone. The service is about to begin. Thank you for joining us at Concordia. You are always welcome here. Of the coming of the Lord, He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of His terrible. Shadow, your love. 
light in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty force, you go, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. seated. Was that a way to start the worship service? Outstanding. Thank you all. Great vocals, Micah. Well, uh, happy Sunday. And is this technically 4th of July weekend? I'm not sure. So if it is or if it isn't, happy 4th of July coming up, right? That way I'm, I'm safe. But let's pray as we continue in worship today. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for the chance to be together. Lord, thank you for the worship. Thank you for the communion. Thank you for the word, and thank you for the fellowship we have with you and with one another. Lord, bless us and strengthen us in this time that we would be prepared to serve you all throughout this coming week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
You know, our God is holy. It means he is perfect, righteous, without flaw, without blemish, without stain. And the reality is we have this God who is holy, and he invites us to be holy like him. But we fall so far short of that. And yet in his love for us, he's made accommodation. He invites us to bring all of our brokenness and all of our sin and all of our failure to him, to confess it and to trust that through the blood of Christ, he makes us holy. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we come before you this day and we confess that we are broken and sinful and flawed and all the holiness you invite us to experience, we we fall so far short. Gracious Father, forgive us. The sins of our thoughts and our words and our actions, Lord, the sins that on our minds in this very moment we lift to you. Father, in the face of our sin, it seems like we're helpless, but we are not. We have the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, that washes us clean. And so, Lord, forgive us for the sake of Jesus and in his name, amen. Dear friends, what a wonderful, amazing blessing that despite our faults and flaws, the Holy One who went to the cross for us has given his life and shed his blood so that you and I can be set free. And so hear these words. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Would you please rise for the reading of God's word? The scripture reading for today is from the book of Judges, chapters 4 and 5, where we read these selected verses. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lipidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went up to her for their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will leave Sisera, the commander of Habin's army, with his chariots and his troops, to the Kishon River, and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go, but if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course you are taking, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang this song. When the princes of Israel take the lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. The children in the balcony are invited to come down at this time for the children's message. Please join with me as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. Please be seated as the children come forward for the children's message. All right, how are you? Hi, how are you? Come right on in. How are you guys doing? You doing okay today? You doing okay? 
Good, good. Who's doing really well today? Give me a thumbs up. You doing really well? You are doing really well? Good, 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 good. All right. Well, first of all, I can move my stall. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys came so we could talk for just a minute because I need to ask you a couple of important things about what's going on right now this summer, you know. But first of all, I want to say, because maybe we haven't met yet, that my name is Pastor Steve. And so uh, I'm really glad to see all of you. And I saw, I'm really glad to see so many thumbs up when we were talking about who's doing really, really well. So this is uh, the 4th of July holiday, right? It's a holiday. Who's doing something? Who's got something special planned? Let me see some hands here. Just one special plan? Boy, have your parents meet with us at the front of the service after when they're… No, okay, so we got a few more hands. Okay, doing special things. Fourth of July, you don't know what, what that is? Well, it's kind of an important… Who knows what the Fourth of July, what, why it's special? Oh, okay, so you don't know if we're doing… What's, what's special about the Fourth of July? Celebration of the United States. Yeah, it's a celebration. You have the United States. It's celebrating our independence. You know that. Uh, let's see if we can do a little math here. Um, what year is this? This is 2023, right? Okay. And the independence of the nation was in 1776. Who's got the answer to the number of years? What birthday? <laughs> wow. How about 247 years? Isn't that amazing? That's pretty amazing, isn't it? I asked the 930 group what, uh, what the Independence Day was all about, and the fellow that was sitting right about where you're sitting right here, he said to me, that was when the Continental Congress declared independence from Great Britain, and I'm going, would you like to have the rest of the, uh, the uh, conversation for us? But it is a celebration of independence, and, and this, our country has been independent for 247 years. And, you know, I think of a Bible verse sometimes when, when I think about our Independence Day, and it's, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. God has blessed us, don't you think, for so many years. And one of the reasons why we have been blessed is because so many people who are part of our country do so many things that are, that are right and good to help one another and, and to do good things for us. Um, I think of those who have served in the military and, and are maybe serving in the military right now and, and the protection that we have through our military services. And I think about uh, people who are a part of our police departments and a part of our fire departments and people who are our first responders when there's an accident and how they help to take care of people. And that's a part of the celebration too that we are able to serve, serve each other and to care for each other. And that's a real blessing of God. And one of the things, besides shooting off maybe some fireworks or maybe having uh, a picnic or something like that, one of the things that I think is important about an Independence Day celebration like July 4th is to tell people how much we appreciate what they do. So you know what I'm going to ask us to do here in just a second? I'm going to, I'm going to have some people stand, and I'm going to ask that, that, uh, for them to stand and let us say thank you to them, okay? We're going to say thank you for your service. Okay? So if you have, are currently in the military or have served in the military, if you would stand. If, uh, yeah, if you are uh, police or fire and have served or serving now, stand. Or, and if you have, uh, uh, are part of our ambulance services, our emergency room services, doctors, nurses, if you would stand, please. And as you look out and see all of the people that are there, on the count of three, let's say, thank you for your service. Are you ready? One, two, three. Thank you for your service. So we're going to celebrate not only what God has done to bless our country, but we also remember what others do to serve and bless us as well. Let's pray, shall we? Dear Lord, we thank you in this independence holiday for the blessings that we enjoy, the blessings of your hand and the blessings of those who uh, care and serve us as well. Make these days very special. 
and receive our praise and thanksgiving for our nation. And we pray this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, thank you so much. And uh, have a happy Independence July 4th celebration, okay? As the children are making their way back, I invite the ushers to come on forward and uh, help us. They'll be passing the offering plates back and forth, and if you've brought an offering or your tithes or other gifts, feel free to put them in there. I also want to encourage you, you can always make your gift online. Uh, if you go to concordia.cc or if you go through the Concordia app, uh, it's pretty obvious that there are ways to make those uh, donations, and so thank you for all of the gifts that you offer to us. As the ushers are finishing our offerings, I want to remind you that we believe in prayer. In fact, we are a praying congregation, and I encourage you, if you have a prayer request this morning, feel free to submit that to the Concordia prayer list. You can find that online, and you can submit those requests if you go to concordia.cc and then a forward slash. I guess it doesn't matter. You can go backward or forward slash and the word prayer and uh, you'll have the opportunity to submit that prayer request. The other thing that is available to you this morning, if you would like to have someone pray with you, you know how powerful that can be, to have someone listen and pray with you. We will have prayer partners right here at the front of the church this morning, and uh, they will pray with you. It's all completely confidential, but they would be honored to lift your request before our God. You know, this morning our worship service finds its center in Holy Communion. This is a meal that God has given us where he brings his very self to us. Uh, we receive the very body and blood of Jesus Christ through the elements of bread and wine. And yet God's word tells us that we need to be prepared. That when we come to communion, we need to come in faith. Believing that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and believing that he meets us here, just as I said. But it also tells us that we need to come in repentance. Not haughty or arrogant or full of ourselves, but instead humble and repentant, and seeking the forgiveness, the wholeness that comes through Jesus Christ. If, uh, if you are not prepared to receive communion this morning, let's say uh, you're here, or if you're with a younger person who hasn't been confirmed, I'd still invite you to come forward, but if you simply cross your arms when you approach the communion table, it'll be a sign to those of us who are serving communion to give you a blessing instead. But will you join me? On the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Welcome to the Lord's table.
was near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise Dear friends, may this true body and precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you to true faith, to life everlasting. Go in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood near a dead could never afford our sins they are many his mercy is
Judges is the most violent book in the Bible. Filled with bloodshed and an ongoing cycle of sin. The people of Israel rebel. God allows them to be oppressed. They cry out for help and repent. God sends a judge to deliver them. After a time of peace, the cycle begins again. The people fall back into sin and idolatry. The book of Judges points to the one true deliverer, the one who can rescue us from our sin, Jesus. So we are going to take a look at the book of Judges today, and we're looking at chapter 4. You know, I just, as I was sitting here and we were singing it, we were going through communion, and I've, I've had the privilege of being here for all three of the services today, and the, the music is uh, similar throughout. But one of the things that struck me in, in our service as, as we were singing this last song, the little chorus that says, our sins, they are many, but His grace, His, his, grace, his mercy is more, it's more. There couldn't be a better summary, I think, of the book of Judges because you are going to get to read through and think about and listen to all kinds of sin. But at the end of the day, the faithful remnant of people who move into that life and await the coronation of a king that would give them an identity as God's chosen people experience grace and mercy more than they could ever imagine. There's a lot going on in Judges. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for the privilege of coming together today to look into this Old Testament book, but let it speak with absolute immediate power and relevance to our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' strong and precious name. Amen. So I love chapter 4 of the book of Judges because it's got some it's got a, a, a kind of a call to action, and, and I love those kind of moments in people's lives when there's just this call to action. And it sounds something like this in Judges chapter 4, verse 14. This is Deborah, who is uh, one of the judges of Israel, and, and Deborah, by the way, would be one of the, the judges of faith and insight from the Old Testament laws and the Old Testament prophecies and all of those kinds of things. This is kind of a highlight moment in the book of Judges. It, it begins to cascade downhill a little bit after Deborah, but we're in for a good morning as we listen to what she's got to, what God has to say to us through her. And this is what she is saying to the commander of her army, a man whose name was uh, Barath. And um, she's talking about a man named Sisera, who was the commander of the Canaanite army. And they're in this land of Canaan. This is what she says to the commander. Go. This is the day the Lord has given Sisera, it has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? And it's a, recipro a, a reciprocal, rhetorical, a rhetorical kind of a question. It has an obvious answer. Hasn't the Lord gone ahead of you? And the obvious answer is yes. That's why we anticipate this moment of victory. That's why we anticipate that the one who wants to oppress us will in fact be oppressed, routed, defeated, and when you read to the end of chapter 4, actually is slaughtered. But now we've got it, right now. Go this day. There's something urgent about that message, isn't there? There's something immediate about the things of God in the context and circumstances of, of a day. As a matter of fact, what uh, Deborah is sort of indicating to her commander is that this will be a day like no other. Go. Go. This day. It's a way of, as you think about this, of, of kind of wrapping your, your thoughts around the, what we sometimes call a, uh, a defining moment for life. A defining moment. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to say about a defining moment. First of all, defining moments are rare. 
Secondly, defining moments are rather remarkable. And thirdly, they are also very rich in terms of, of, of the moment. That's a defining moment. And Deborah is saying to the commander, get ready. I want to talk to you about a defining moment. And I know this will come as a shock to some of you, but it, I'm going to talk about baseball. And I'm going to give you a date. It's a defining moment in baseball. And the date is October the 8th, 1956. How many of you know what that defining moment is? Well, crickets, what do you know? <laughs> Actually, it was the day when one pitcher in the World Series threw a perfect game. You got a picture up here. Father's name is Don Larson. By the way, when you read the history of, uh, of that day, Don Larson didn't know he was going to pitch when he got to the ballpark. His name was penciled in to the starting lineup. But if you look up on the scoreboard, you can see the Brooklyn Dodgers playing the New York Yankees, Game 5, 1956 World Series. Dodgers have no runs through the eighth inning. They have no hits, and the Yankees have committed no errors. And this is uh, a pinch hitter who is, happens to be up to bat by the name of Dale Mitchell. He has two strikes on him, and there's two outs, and that pitch will be strike three. No one had ever done it up to that moment, and no one has done it since. You see, defining moments are indeed rare, rich, and remarkable. Now, after that moment in Don Larson's career, the rest of his career extended. It was, he was a major league pitcher for sure, but it wasn't particularly remarkable. It was just very average. But he did have that one moment in time. Now, I'm not trying to go Whitney Houston on you, but there is something about that song that makes sense for defining moments. Give me one moment in time when I'm more than I thought I could be. You see, we have those kind of moments in time too as we engage the goodness and grace of God in Jesus Christ. In an ancient day, it was to engage the goodness and promises of God that pointed to, to Jesus Christ. But we have these moments when I'm more than I thought I could be. Go this day because the Lord has gone ahead of you. Now, as we think about that exchange and we think about the fact that the army of the Israelites are going to battle the army of the Canaanites, it's important to kind of to understand the, 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 the dynamics of, of that moment, to just kind of step back for a minute and kind of say, what brings you to this kind of point? What, what in, in history sort of sets all of this in place? And I want us to think back to uh, the time of Abraham. Abraham had been told by God that he would go to a land that he would show him, he and his family. And in Genesis chapter 12, Abraham hears God say, I am going to bless you, and you will be a blessing to others. And I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you. And through you, all the nations and peoples of the earth will be blessed. And Abraham was on his way to Canaan. But the Canaanites weren't any friendlier then than they were at the time of Deborah. And as Abraham moves into Canaan, we have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, just to kind of give you an idea of the neighborhood and how God felt about how the neighborhood was doing. So we move into this kind of, 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 of promise. And Last week, as you're looking at, at, at chapter 2 of, of, uh, 
of the book of Judges, you know that there was a question that emerged, and it had to do with the covenant and the promise of of blessing and the promised land, but suddenly confronted by the angel of the Lord, and Pastor Tucker was very correct in saying in his message, this is a pre-incarnational presence of Jesus Christ. He is there because they are discussing the fact that things are hard, things are difficult, things are challenging, and maybe God has reduced His covenant of blessing from from that which is unconditional to to conditional. So maybe we need to try harder. Maybe we need to keep the law more carefully. Maybe we need to be very circumspect with every step that we take. And wouldn't it be just like Jesus to show up in a conversation like that and say, no, nothing has changed. Understand who you are by understanding who God is. Have no other gods before Him and understand what that means in terms of your life. Nothing in the covenant changes. Unconditional love is yours. And so this, this whole promise and, of blessing is, is kind of, of, of brought forward again and reestablished And Deborah stands and says, go. This is the day that the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. The Lord has gone ahead of you. We can be confident in the Lord. The second thing we want to think about is not just the the promise of Abraham that that would continue to all of God's people, and it was an unconditional uh, love that was expressed in that promise, but the understanding that the people were in a time of transition from the leadership of Joshua into the leadership of judges, multiple leaders, judges. And it's interesting to me that in these times of transition, one of the things that is, that is always important is the idea of, of strength and courage. If you think about that moment in time in history, you only have to take a couple of steps back and remember how it was that Moses, who, who led the people of the, the children of Israel out of their slavery in Egypt, led them to a promised land that was inhabited by Canaanites. Moses would take the the man who was at his side, who who watched him, who participated with him in terms of leadership and and spiritual growth and all of these kinds of things, the, the kind of development, the leadership development that happened in the life of Joshua. And here's what Moses would say to him before Moses died. He would lay hands on him and pray for him, and he would say, be strong and be courageous. And Joshua would step to the front of the people as their God-appointed leader in God's word to Joshua before he would go into the Canaanite city of Jericho. And he would say, be strong and be courageous. Be strong and be courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not tremble. For the Lord your God goes with you wherever you go. That makes today very special. This is the day. And the Israelites go in, and they capture the city of Jericho. They destroy the walls that were the the source of protection, and all of the armies and the idols of Jericho are slaughtered. No other gods before me. Luther, by the way, would write and explain that, saying, what does that mean to us? That we would fear, love, and trust in God above all all things. I love that because that's sort of what Deborah, without saying those words, that's sort of what Deborah is asking her general to do. Love, trust, Jesus Christ, love, trust the word and promises of God, go into battle as he leads us, fear, love, and trust. There is a quote by Winston Churchill that's an interesting quote. He says this about being strong and being courageous. He defines courage like this. He says, courage is rightly esteemed the first of human virtues. It is the quality which guarantees all others. What does that mean for us? If we think about the virtues of God's Old Testament people, there are certain things that come to my mind. Things like love for God, love for others. 
But if it's true that courage precedes all of that, courage brings that home and gives power to express all of that, it's a way of saying that the gift that you receive from God to love Him and love others doesn't come wrapped with cowardice, it comes wrapped with courage. If you think about trust, it's a gift that you receive from God, not wrapped with cowardice, it's wrapped with courage. If you think about sacrifice and the promises of sacrifice that God would make over the ages to, the, to people, even to the point of Christ on the cross, sacrifice doesn't come wrapped in cowardice, it comes wrapped in courage. And so today, to, to say to her general, as Deborah would today, Today we go. This is the day we go forward. That is wrapped not in cowardice, but in courage. I want to give you a Steve Wagner definition of courage, and so you can disagree, and, and it won't hurt my feelings that you want to be wrong. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Actually, I'm going to say if you can improve on it, text me, and the next time I have this thought, I'll have a better definition for courage. But here, when I think about courage, and I think about this in the, in the book of Judges, here's how I would define courage. It is the spiritual, it is, it is spiritual determination accelerating. That's what courage is to me. It's spiritual determination accelerating. And at the same time, it's fear running out of gas. Spiritual determination, accelerating. That's what was happening in Deborah's life, and that's what she was asking her general to be and to do and to think, to accelerate the spiritual determination because courage feeds on the spiritual blessings, presence, and power of God. The other interesting definition that I have for, um, that I found for, for courage, uh, in addition to baseball, I sort of like to watch an occasional Western movie, and John Wayne had a spiritual definition for courage. And John Wayne said this, courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. You see what Deborah's saying to her general, her commander? Saddle up, let's go. God has gone before you. Now, how do you get into circumstances like we're seeing in the, in the book of Judges here? How do, how do, we, how do we, we, we sort of see this kind of attempts at, at coexisting between the, 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 the reality of who God is and the, and, the, and the commandments of Moses that say, first things first, love Him first, follow Him first, and the, the idea of what the, who the Canaanites were, who were sort of the cohabitants of, uh, of, of this promised land. For the Canaanites, the idea of worshiping God was to, was to worship a pantheon of 234 gods, chief of whom one was Baal. Now, Baal was a god of fertility, and so that had certain implications, two kind of implications. The first was, when there was worship of Baal, there was, it was always accompanied with sexual immorality and, and the kind of perversion that, uh, that attends that. But it was also attended by the sacrifice of children. You see, that's a part of what fertility is. Let's make Baal happy. But what God's people quickly realized is the truth doesn't coexist next to deceitfulness and lies. The reality of God as, as, as creator and redeemer and, and sanctifier is compromised next to the gods that require all kinds of things that are dark and venomous. But that's what sin requires. We get into a cycle of sin sometimes. And that's what God was 
wanting to, one of the things that God, I know, would have wanted to prevent as his people came into the land of Canaan. Last Sunday, Pastor Tucker shared with you the, uh, what he called the cycle of sin, and, and it is found in the, the book of uh, Judges. I just would review that with you briefly. It starts out with apostasy, which is the love of, of, of sin and sinfulness, slavery. Sometimes we, it moves to that, and sometimes we use a word like addictions. Crying out, which is to say, I'm, I'm, I'm desperate now, God. Please help me. And God comes through and delivers. It seems to me, for me, that one of the things that God wants me to know and perhaps us to know together is that we always want to be alert and on guard to that which is around us in terms of, our, in terms of thinking, in terms of direction in life and, and the things that we can embrace, the things to which we'll say yes, but the things to which we must also say no. I think about the cycle of sin, and, I, and again, I want to think backwards just a little bit, but I'd like to go all the way back to the beginning of time in Genesis 1 and 2 with Adam and Eve. Now, when you think about Adam and Eve, they are living in a world that was created by God. He himself said it was good, and it's absolutely perfect, and everything that is a part of that world is for their good care and pleasure. When I think about Adam and Eve, they're the first man and first woman, and they're created without sin, so that there is a strength of faithfulness that is just inherent to, to the righteousness that, and sinlessness of Adam and Eve. And I think of the intimacy and the joy that they had in that garden place when God would come and visit them on a daily basis. In the history of mankind, if there were ever two people who had perhaps, and I say that because I know the end of the story, perhaps the strength to resist the appeal of sin, perhaps the strength to resist being drawn into the cycles of sin, perhaps the sense to, to resist that which was antithetical to the purposes of, of God, it would be Adam and Eve, perfect. But you know the story too, don't you? And they failed. And death and sin became a part of the reality of a broken world. I think about that in terms of my own life. And I say, if Adam and Eve couldn't resist, how can Steve even begin to think of resisting. And the cycle of sin draws me in. I want to say to you, Concordia, dear family and friends, and I want to say to my brother and dear friend, Bill Tucker, I appreciate so much that you are my pastor. And I know that if you were preaching this sermon right now, you would be saying how important it is to be in God's Word every day. Every day. Because on my own, I will get sucked into the vortex of that cycle of sin. I need God's Word to be my strength. I need God's Word to be my shield. I need God's Spirit to be my warrior. I need the prayers of a congregation like Concordia to, to remember me because like you, I stand in those places so different from Adam and Eve and can find a cycle of sin so very enticing. But God has gone ahead of us. And that's the kind of good news that Barack needed to hear. It's the kind of good news that Deborah could share. He has gone ahead of us, and this is our calling to courage. Two things as we close our message today that I want to call a calling to courage. The first is to live a life of distinction, to live a life of distinction. And by that, I would just suggest to you the very same thing that God's Old Testament people were learning and relearning and would learn again 
on the other side of the trauma and, and mistakes that occurred, and you'll see those in the book of Judges, but to stand with distinction, to say, there'll be no other God before you, Lord God, in my life. I need to be reminded of that every single day because I'm so easily distracted. I'm so easily fall in love with other stuff. But I want to live a life that's distinctive. I want to live a life that isn't wrapped in the things of cowardice, but in the things of courage. Like the life of love and trust and sacrifice toward God and toward other. I want my life to count and I want my life to be distinct. I need God's courage to choose each day to live for Him. Be distinctive. Saddle up. Second thing that I want you to hear and consider this morning is to live a life of blessing toward God and to others. The calling of courage is to live a life of distinction and it is to live a life of blessing toward God and others. Live a blessing of life toward God. We do that in worship and praise. I love the music of throughout the morning at Concordia. It's, it's a privilege to worship here three times. I've, I've had three times the fun you guys have had today and I'm feeling it. I'm feeling the love, you know. But to love, to trust, to sacrifice those things. Why would we want to do that in that way toward God? Because he loved us first. That's what John said in 1 John chapter 4. Because he doesn't love just me and you. He loves the world. That's what Jesus said to a man named Nicodemus. He so loved the world. Of course I want to praise him. Of course I want to love him back. Of course I want to live for him. And so that becomes a part of, of who I am toward God. And then in terms of, of living a life of blessing toward others, I was thinking about this the other day as I was reading a book by Thomas Sign, and it's a book called The Mustard Seed Conspiracy. And in that book, he said this about blessing others. He said, the cry of your neighbor is your calling in Christ. Isn't that interesting? The cry of your neighbor is your calling in Christ. I need to, to listen more closely to my neighbor. I want to be available to them. It's my calling in Christ. I want to connect with the people who are part of my family in the way Jesus would want us to connect. It's my calling in Christ. Someone once said that ministry is about finding a need and filling it, finding a hurt and bringing healing to it. That's a pretty good way of saying, just listen carefully, and you'll know exactly how to bless those who are closest to you. That's your calling in Jesus Christ. We're going to speak the benediction here in just a moment. And one of the things that I know about Concordia as well is that we've got three little words that kind of connect together that talk about this second point of, of living with blessing toward God and others. And those words are love, serve, and shine. When I think about those words and I think about what it means to have courage for living, all I can say to myself and to you is saddle up. Would you stand, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for the, a great word of, of hope, a great word that would be uh, a calling, a great understanding of what it means to be strong and courageous in you, and a great way of, of understanding that you have gone before us, Lord God, so that we have a sense of being and living in a courageous way that uh, expresses love to you and to others and that is so different and distinctive. Only you could create it in us and through us. For that, Lord, we want to say thank you. And for that, Lord, we want to say put us in the saddle. And to that end, we pray in Jesus' strong and precious name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you 
and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, go out into the world, shine like stars in the universe as you hold out God's word of truth and life in Jesus Christ.